Hi, Jim. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, Merry Christmas. Hey, same to you. I was wondering if you're going to say that or Happy Holidays. But you're uh, an old-fashioned guy. It is. Uh, we're taping this on Christmas Eve, Eve, Eve. I guess right. It's two days before Christmas uh, Eve. I, I, yeah, I, I, the twenty-second. I know that much at least. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, and you've just declared yourself uh, as a traditionalist. I, I have. I mean, I certainly am aware that there are other faiths and people of no faith uh, who are also in America today. But I think this is a, a country with a great Christian heritage, and I'm always happy, uh, whenever possible, to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. And do you you wish it? To them indiscriminately. In other words, you don't say to yourself, "Now, is this actually a Christian?" Before you, I, I, I do find myself, and, I, he, and, and I just happen to know you, Bob, well to know that your background. Uh, I, I, know, I realize you. What, moved, whatever moved, the status moved, moved of my soul to, at to, the moment, to better things in your mind in terms right. of elevation of knowledge and enlightenment. But by background, at least, uh, not only are you a Christian. I think you're from Texas, as I recall. I was brought up a Southern Baptist. And yeah, so, so you've got a lot to overcome, don't you, Bob? Uh, well, uh, actually, when I get to the pearly gates, I think I've got <laughs> most of what I have to overcome has accumulated since I was a Southern Baptist. Um, I think you'll be in better shape at that point. Now, you, you are uh, you're a Protestant, I assume. I, I, I am a sort of a non-denominational Protestant. I, I mean, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I accept Jesus Christ as my... Lord and Savior. Uh, I believe he died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. Um, but try to avoid being more uh, doctrinaire than that, although there's pl admittedly there's plenty of doctrine there. So you don't call yourself an evangelical? I mean, I, I, no, in the sense of what that, what that brings up to people, no. I mean, I, I try to do, you know, my thing and, and, and serve God my way, but I don't uh, preach. I don't, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, Okay, and what um, what does Christmas? What is the resonance of Christmas for you, as opposed to say the resonance of Easter? Well, I mean, Easter obviously is the you know the the the, the big day. I mean, I mean, is I mean, it? I, it's bigger than Christmas. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I mean, I mean the, the central miracle of Christianity is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on 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 that day, and that you know is is a much bigger deal and it's, it, you know uh, I, mean, I mean Christmas is a great celebration and so on but it, it's obviously been heavily commercialized in a, in a way that sort of is off-putting to many um, having said that I think that people should be free to celebrate any holiday they want without being made to be self-conscious about it and I have been disturbed over the years by the, what I see as sort of a, a, a war against Christmas uh, waged by a, a, a hostile culture that has succeeded uh, pretty substantially in uh, rooting out, uh, you know, mangers and crash scenes and so on from public places all across this country. Um, and I mean, the, the, the argument of the uh, of the of the people you're opposed to, I guess, is is partly that tax dollars should not be spent for religious displays, right? But you don't accept. No, that. I mean that's not really the argument they make because no, they're not really talking about tax dollars. Oh, okay. they, they would define tax dollars as if it sits on a piece of public property, even though a church paid for it, mm -hmm. that's tax dollars, which which I think is absurd. I mean, I think that it, look, it's fair to say there's a pretty big constituency in this country that simply doesn't like religion. Uh, they particularly dislike Christianity, um, and they are out to extirpate uh, its public observance uh, from as many places they, as they can. Um, they keep running up against the, the wall of, of public opinion, but the public, although clearly pro-Christian and pro-Merry Christmas, uh, doesn't have as many lawyers, and so they tend to lose these legal fights over whether or not you know the, the some town hall and. You know, Connecticut or Kentucky can can display a a, a, a baby Jesus in the, in the manger. So you'd be fine with the idea that the the tax dollars can't subsidize this stuff. You'd be okay with drawing the line there, if, if uh... you know. I mean, I mean, I, is it okay to have in God we trust on coins? I mean, there's tax dollars in there in there somehow. I think probably yeah, speaking, although... the government makes money on a coin. Uh, in terms of selling it, I don't, I don't mean collectors' items. I just mean you know, if a, if, a, if a coin is if a quarter is worth a quarter, and it takes costs the government two cents to print it. But I mean, I'm playing games here. The point is, whether it's chaplains or prayers in, in Congress, I, no, I, I, I do believe that 
the so-called separation of church and state, this wall, uh, it is, does not have anywhere near the constitutional sanction that that that, that, that the ACLU and like-minded people uh, say it does. The, the, the word separation of church and state doesn't appear in the Constitution. It comes from Thomas Jefferson uh, 20 years later mm-hmm. uh, in a letter uh, uh, that he wrote uh, in like 1803 or so. And uh, I think what the founders clearly had in mind was that this would be, a, 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 to put it bluntly, a, a, a Christian country, and that the re- but even if it weren't Christian, although it was, but the religious institutions would sort of do a lot of the work that the government didn't do. That you know, the, the religious institutions, one way or another, would provide for education, would provide for what passed for welfare, what passed for, for a lot of health care back then. It was sort of assumed that the sort of non-governmental social capital um, of the country uh, that in many ways makes life worth living and makes life possible uh, would be provided by religious institutions of, of all kinds. And so the idea that, that those same institutions are sort of the enemy of the government I, I think is completely ahistorical and anti-constitutional. Okay. I, and I do think it's true that, that at the time of the Constitution it was actually accepted that individual states... Uh, at that point, did some of the individual states actually did have official religions? Did they not? I mean, was, I think, was Maryland a right. Catholic uh, state at that point? I, 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 I think that's right. And, and, and look, these constitutions are shot through with you know the providence is ordained and God is ordained. I mean, again, it's, it's not to say that the founders were Southern Baptists, as you know, they right. weren't. They were mostly you know Episcopalians and, and and various kinds of deists and so on. So they weren't by any stretch holy rollers. They 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 saw themselves as building a secular government, repeat, a secular government mm-hmm. inside a culture and a country that was awash in faith. And, and they were, they, 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 to be clear, they, they wrote into the, 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 you know, the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, you know, no, no religious test for office. I mean, they were mm-hmm. quite explicit. They didn't want anything like, a, I mean, again, states had a lot more power back then, so the states may well have had uh, of official religions. It wasn't federal policy, and it wasn't national policy, and I don't support any change in that. What I do support is a, is a, a reasonable approach where if the people in some town want to put up a, a, Christ, a Christian display for Christmas, it should be left alone. And I, I, mean, I think it's just it's crazy for the left to keep doing this, but they do. And um, Well, it's not it just it the left per se. I mean, well, okay, so leave aside the Constitution. I, I don't think I'm prepared to argue with you there. But just in terms of uh, taking into account, you know, modern sens- sensibilities, or, or, I mean, sensibilities in, in modern America, whether they be religious or not, um, do you, d- does it make any sense to you that there's a distinction between, say, a coin that says, in God we trust, uh, which is something that almost any religious person in America would subscribe to, and on the other hand, um, specifically Christmas, Christmassy uh, imagery that actually might alienate uh, some some religious people in America, like Jews and Muslims. Well, I think this is where politics comes in. Uh, 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 you know, I think that, that, that you know, the minority has rights, but so does the majority. And if the majority comes up with a plan for celebrating Christmas that doesn't adversely affect anybody in any real way, and I emphasize the word real, uh, then I don't see why the majority shouldn't uh, have a say-so. The majority gets to to rule on uh, most issues that don't involve the direct uh, uh, well-being or defense of a minority group in terms of, you know, due process and so on. So, I, I mean, if, if obviously there probably wouldn't be much demand for a Christmas display in, you know, say, Flatbush, Brooklyn. Uh, where all or most of the population is, you know, Orthodox Jew- Jewish, uh, but I don't see why. By the same token, I don't see why it wouldn't be, would be wrong for them to put up a menorah candle or something for Passover or, or whatever else they might do. Uh, 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 there's a the, 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 the little string they put around a community, you know, the, 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 the sort of a, the erev, a, a ruv, I think it's called, which is you know like to. I, I'm not explaining it very well, but in certain Orthodox places, they actually put a physical string. To communicate, uh, to make a wall so that you can be inside of that wall. It's an, it's an Orthodox Jewish practice. They do it. Nobody seems to mind. Uh, the ACLU just hasn't gotten to, to gotten around to opposing that yet. Uh, and it makes the community a community. I think there's a there's a positive upside to a lot of this religious observance. If you want, well, it makes to it makes the religious com- part, community a community. But 
you don't agree that it to some extent can impede the formation of community in a broader sense that is to say that the you know the local or regional community of american citizens well, generically well i think again that's, that's where the politics comes in i mean look if i were an elected official and 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 i were trying to get votes from everybody and not make enemies, I, I'd be very conscious of how to do this in a way that did, 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 mm-hmm. didn't offend, if, offend people. Mm-hmm. And it's not to say that you wouldn't get abuses somewhere in you know, Gaza, Georgia. I, I, I'm sure you would. Um, but, but I think you get abuses now. And what I hate to see is a, a decision that is obviously rooted in the folk political practices of populations has been taken away from them and given to lawyers. Yeah, I I have, I mean, in some realms, I have real sympathy for your position. I mean, mean, leaving aside, you know, uh, uh, public displays and publicly subsidized displays and so on, on the Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays issue, you know, on the one hand, uh, Happy Holidays is just such a sterile phrase. And when I, you know, to me, Merry Christmas has a real aura of warmth about it, even if it's taken as an essentially secular greeting, which it was when I was a kid, right? I mean, I didn't think of it as as an especially religious thing to say, and yet it has these connotations for me that do convey kind of warmth and charity in a way that Happy Holidays doesn't. So on that side, you know, in in that sense, I'm on the side of Merry Christmas. On the other hand, I don't like... uh, the virtue of Happy Holidays is you can extend it as a greeting to anybody without asking yourself what their religious background is, if any. I mean, I don't really like things that make me go around saying, you know, uh, is he Christian, is she Jewish? You know, it's, it's like I, I just as soon kind of not, not, not divide people up into those categories except when absolutely necessary. I mean, these are reasonable points, and everybody, everybody has to answer them differently. And as I said, if, 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 if you were... Bob Goldberg, I probably would have. Uh, I, I know I wouldn't have said Merry Christmas, um, you know. A, a, and uh, um, yeah, I that, hope that anybody uh, in, in the massive uh, blogging has audience who's, who's, who's not a Christian or doesn't like Christmas, for, you know, or doesn't su- endorse Christmas even as a holiday, uh, isn't doesn't take offense. Uh, I, 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 it, it is. We've gotten in a strange sort of hair trigger situation where. If a Christian even sort of communicates uh, his faith and what his faith tells him or her, uh, somebody takes offense. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, I, I don't think this is going to lead to the end of Christianity. I, I'm, I'm sort of think the sort of think the opposite. I think that that there's sort of a a, a, a backlash brewing against all this sort of overwhelming secularism. I think mm-hmm. that uh, you know the, the, Rick, the Rick Warrens of the world are are gaining power in part because people think to themselves if the liberal culture hates this stuff so much. Maybe there's something to it, you know. I mean, I mean, I mean, if you know, if if, if the people who have brought us, you know, Sister Boom Boom in, in San Francisco, uh, hate 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 organized religion, then maybe there's something to organized religion. So I mean, this is I'm thoroughly satisfied that if Christianity will survive all all, all the, as as well as the other great religions survive all these on, onslaughts, and as a matter of fact, they even get stronger. Okay, and. Kind of final question on this point. I mean, can you, I'm not sure it's entirely a, a, a secular opposition. I mean, can you imagine how, if, say, it were 30 or 40 years ago, uh, when you were just starting to hear maybe some resistance to, to, to traditions like this, suppose you're one of the few Jewish kids uh, in, in a school where there's like a Christmas play. Um, would that would you not feel a little awkward? And if you were the parents of a Jewish kid, would you would you not um, kind of wish that they would you know if your kid is recruited to play a wise man or something? Well, I, I mean, I think I'd, again, this is this is where politics and human nature and judgment and and, and, and I, the point you made before about the sense of community that a country has. Mm-hmm. Do we have room for people of different faiths? And I, I would remind you that that there's probably no more large group in America that's more actively philo-Semitic than 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 you know, born again Christians. Uh, 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 there, there, well, there's a kind of ambiguity in their there, position. There's a kind actually. of ambiguity, but, there, but there's still an active, you know, desire to sort of, you know, get to know people who wrote the Old Testament and mm-hmm. so on. I mean, it's a little, it's a little, it can be a little cloying and off-putting. I'm not disputing all that. Mm-hmm. I, I guess I would say that, look, you know, it, it, at one time or another, all of us in, in the horrors and tortures of being in the third grade 
had to put up with stuff we didn't like for whatever reason it was. Going to going to gym, you know, uh, you know that's you know gym, or, or you know getting a shot or you know a field trip you didn't want to go to or something. I mean, it, it just there's got to be some room. And again, I would just say that the worst kinds of people to decide issues not of it, not of rights. I, I like you. I totally agree that if if somebody's real rights, the real right to life and due process and you know, uh, unfair taxation and cruel and unusual punishment. Those those rights always have to be defended, be defended if necessary, by courts. Mm-hmm. I just hate to see people run into the courts because they see something on a town square or in the local public school they don't like. Mm-hmm. I just think that's the wrong way to handle it. And a um, tangentially related question. Am I right to think that the, um, well, or I should say, is this true for a Christian? I mean, it's true for me that Christmas has real connotations of kind of universal brotherhood and peace on earth. Is that are, are those are those like secular connotations or does it does it have that vibe for you? Well, as well? I mean, peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's one of the, that's one of the right, famous exactly. Christmas and, I, I think. Look, I mean, look, Christ, Christ, Christians aspire at their best, and they've fallen short many times to actually spread, you know, uh, peace, love, and charity. You know, the greatest commandment is uh, this is love uh, uh, to the world, and, and uh, you know. Uh, I, I don't want. I'm enough of a secular to not want to try and conflate the two too much. As, as Martin Luther said 500 years ago, our, our, our lives must be lit by the lamps of faith and the lamps of reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the lamp of faith is guides you in one area, and, it, and in my mind, at least, is mostly a personal thing. Uh, and then there's what we learn from the light of reason, which comes to us from you know plenty of non-Christians such as Aristotle and you know, uh, you, know you know any number of other philosophers who are who are pre-Christians plus plenty of Christian philosophers. And that light of reason tells us, you know, this is the way you organize a society. Uh, uh, you know, this is you, you have a democracy, you have rule of law, property rights, all those all those good things. And I'm perfectly content to see both uh, lamps, if you will. Uh, enshrined as as the, as the guiding lights for our, our our country and our culture. Okay. Well, we got a natural segue to Rick Warren here, I think. Yeah. And I think I can uh, kind of imagine which side you're taking on the Rick Warren controversy. <laughs> um, you would like to see Rick Warren represented at the inauguration. Well, it's, it's Obama's choice. Uh, yeah. and, and by the way, I, I, I like Rick Warren. Uh, um, have I mean, you met him? I have. I have I've met times. him, too. And he's a very nice guy, and I think he's done the Lord's work literally on issues like AIDS and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he's been a positive force for society and the world. And I think selling 25 million copies tells you that he's had a pretty deep, deep impact in the culture. So I totally understand um, why Obama would uh, 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 want him, because, you know, as, as Obama said over and over during the campaign, I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to build bridges mm-hmm. and so on. So Now... At the same time, I would not be surprised, frankly, if, if, if in the end Warren doesn't appear. That, that that you know that the prospect of being a divisive force hmm. uh, leads Warren to get a hold of Obama and say, "Look, you know, I don't I don't want to disrupt your inauguration because there's somebody whistling or you know, hooting hmm. or heckling or something." At, at the, I mean, who knows? But uh, uh, it's been quite a controversy. But you know, if I, if I were Obama, I would definitely want him. Yeah, I mean, I. Uh it's a tough issue. The I, I certainly kind of identify with um, Obama supporters who increasingly fret that he's just in a more general way taking his base for granted, you know. I mean, it, his appointments in, in many ways have kind of sent that message. Um, he, and he's also been uh, reluctant to punish people who in the ordinary course of politics would have been punished like, uh, like Lieberman, you know. Um, and... Uh, you know, I, I've said this before, but during the election campaign, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton supporters were, were were going around talking to people like in the foreign policy community, you know, people, think tank types saying, you know, if you support Obama, you'll never work in this town again. And it turned out that uh, Obama won, but she was still right. They don't, they're not getting the jobs, you know. And and uh, I, I think in, a, in a, to some extent, I think a lot of this is wrapped up. And, I mean, you have the very specific, narrowly targeted interest group reaction to the Rick Warren thing, but I think also he's come to be kind of a symbol uh, of this larger unease with uh, with the path Obama is, is taking, which, as you point out, is totally consistent 
with his claim to want to reach out and transcend traditional divisions. Um, it's just that traditionally uh, politicians have, you know, uh, have rewarded their base more, more than he's doing. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Traditionally, they always have, and I, uh, uh, I mean, oftentimes they have, and I don't think it's necessarily to, to, to their their credit. I mean, uh, I mean, John Kennedy, for example, had a Republican Defense Secretary, a Republican Treasury Secretary. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt filled up his cabinet with Republicans, especially as, as World War II began. Um, you know, I mean, again, a president is unique in terms of being elected by all the people, and look, Obama. Yeah, it sounds horrible to say it this way. He doesn't really need the left anymore. What he what he needs is the country, uh, um, and if he if he does the, does right by the country, uh, you know the, the politics of that will, will will take care of themselves. I mean, I, I I do concede that if you can be you can be so alienating from your party that you wind up getting primaried, as sort of happened to Carter in 1980, and and, right. and would have happened to you know uh, you know uh, uh, John Tyler had he. Um, Run again, and you know, for the presidency in 1844. Um, so it, it does, it does happen. Um, just not uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson in '68. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, if Obama wants to be successful in a country this polarized and divided, and so on like that, he needs to be doing more of what he's doing, not less. And if the the left of his party succeeds in mow mowing him into submission. Uh, That'll be to his detriment and also to the country's detriment. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, it does happen, though. Bases want to be remembered. I, I remember when uh, Bush, too, was making his uh, first-term appointments, and uh, the base started complaining uh, at how centrist they were. And that was, and, and, and as I recall, he kind of gave them Ashcroft as a reward. And uh, were you a fan of Bush 43 presidency? Um. No. Okay. So, so, so. I mean, and how will history? But I think. I mean, history will be pretty tough on them um, for, for for following exactly a, a sort of a narrow strategy. Uh, among, well, uh, and lots of lots of lots of different manifestations of that. But, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, come on, Bob, get a hold of yourself there. If you if you're citing Bush forty three. No, that's superior. when you know you've dug yourself a hole. Uh, yeah. No, it's true. I did, As I Bush forty three say, says, I, I, I do think many of my complaints about him have to do with him specifically more than the generic uh, strategy of minding your base, um, which again he didn't seem to necessarily be doing at first. But certainly, uh, as the as the election, the second term election approached, that was that was the way Rove decided to go, um, and. Uh, yeah, okay, you win. Never mind. Let's talk about something else. Uh, let's talk about... Um, we got a couple of scandals to talk about, we do. right? We do. We've got uh, Blagojevich. Right. Um, we've got Madoff. Okay. Uh, which do you find more well, intriguing? Well, I mean, uh, Blagojevich... I, I grew up in Evanston, Illinois, which is a oh, near, really? near suburb of Chicago. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, my formative years were you know, in the Chicagoland area. And that, that, of course, was in the era of the old Mayor Daley, Richard J. Daley, the, the, the mayor in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, as opposed to the, the new mayor, who was the mayor in the 80s, 90s, O's, and you know, who knows how much longer after that. Um, all I can tell you is that you know, Chicago is, has a very corrupt political culture. Uh, it should be no surprise to anybody that a product of that political culture uh, turns out to be a crook. Um, Blagojevich is perhaps more colorful and more defiant and Better documented than, than 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 many of them, but uh, in all honesty, what were you expecting? Uh, something slightly less explicit, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> A little more in the way of nodding and winking, and less in the way of uh, please sign here. I, I mean, I, I I agree. I mean, I think again, I just would say this is this is what you, as a as a general phenomenon, this is what you get in one party cultures. Whether I mean, there's plenty of crooked Repu- the the Nassau County Republican. Machine uh, in Long Island, you know, in the 80s, 70, 78 was, you know, was was thoroughly corrupt, and a bunch of them ended up getting hauled off to jail. Mm-hmm. And there was no checks and balances, and so the Republicans were just free to to steal and everything else uh, like crazy. And then, you know, the Republicans of the late 19th century, after the Civil War, were pretty much a one party regime across the, certainly across the federal government, mm-hmm. and they were thoroughly corrupt. Um, 
and, and so by the same, in the same situation with the Democrats, if, if you have a place where there's no opposition, where the party, one party controls everything, it's just a question of sharing the spoils, um, you, you get this. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and and I, I have to say, although there's no evidence that um, Obama, Barack Obama was... Uh, Involved in any way in this? Quite the contrary, quite I would the, say. Quite, quite, because quite Emmanuel, contrary. on the one phone call, the guy, the I guess representative of Blagojevich, says, uh, you know, Emmanuel is lobbying for somebody, but the guy says, and if we deliver, you know, all we get is appreciation, right? And Emmanuel says, right. Uh, and it's interesting. I mean, I guess that is official code talk, right? All we get is appreciation. That's probably asked in Chicago like dozens of times a day, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean exactly. Just be I mean, I'm still a little puzzled over that. I realize this news came out today about the, uh, uh, you know, but how did it go from 21 phone calls just down to one? Was it was it, were the first reports inaccurate? Uh, but well, I think the deal is one contact with Blagojevich himself, right? And, and that is, wait, is that Obama or Emmanuel? No, talking Emmanuel, to, Emmanuel. Talking to Blagojevich, and three or four with his surrogate, okay. with Blagoj- Blago's surrogate. Right, well, I mean, you know, we're taking the word, so far right now we're taking the word for it, and, and, and I, I'm content to do so. Uh, but I, I will go back to what I was originally saying was for, Barack Obama has been in this culture for 20 years. Now, if if he manages to stay completely clean, well, more power to him. Um, and, and, and I just think this... I'm kind of curious about all the contacts and all the relationships he had uh, with all these people, how he got how he got so far so fast in inside Illinois. And I think that's the real question about uh, what, what, that, what makes Bogoyevich more interesting than, say, Edward Edwards, you know, the mm-hmm. thoroughly crooked you know, governor of Louisiana, or any number of other crooks that have come out of places like New Jersey or uh, yeah. But in this case, it is now on the record that Obama was not going to play ball with these guys, right? Uh, I mean, he, he seems pretty, pretty clean. I mean, it, it, right. It, 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 again, if that's, if that's all there is to it, if, if Patrick Fitzgerald, who I have great confidence in, uh, has nothing more to say about the yeah. topic, and he did, go, I should, he did go out of his way to say in that press yeah. conference when this first got kicked off, you know, this, not, this does not involve Obama at all. Yeah. I am still a little curious about Rahm Emanuel, but I'm... Well, what's interesting to me, the subtext of that question, I don't know how well these two guys knew each other, if at all, but if they knew each who, other who, well, who, who? Uh, whoever, whatever surrogate Ablago that Emanuel was talking to when, when, uh, when he said, yeah, all you get is appreciation... If they knew each other well, then in a way the premise of the question the guy was asking was that in some contexts, Emmanuel might well say, no, you get more than appreciation, right? right? In other words, if, if it's a common way of talking, which I assume it is, a, a common uh, not-so-subtle way of asking whether, you know, something very close to a bribe right. so would to be the, in, in, Interlocutor could have been asking Emmanuel, look, do I get the good deal or not the not-so-good deal? Uh, with, with the presumption being that they know, they both know what the better deal is. Well, no, that's the, the not sweeter, what I meant. I, I mean, I do think the question was, are you going to play dirty or not? And Emmanuel said, no. I, I said, said, no, we're not going to play dirty. I, I'm just saying, if the two knew each other and the question was asked, the premise of asking the question was that Emmanuel was the kind of guy who, in another right. circumstance, might well say yes. That's, that's all that's I'm what, saying. That's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah was, right. The sweeter deal or the not-so-sweet deal. Uh, 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 Emmanuel was saying, look, uh, in this context, you're not getting anything more than just a, a thank you. Yeah. Uh, however, in other contexts, who knows? Yeah. Again, these, these are questions that just, uh, that if, you know, the McCain campaign, not that anybody really laments the McCain campaign, you know, had had been following all these things more closely, uh, and I think reporters now will. I think reporters are, you know, who I, and I think they kind of between liking Obama, not liking Bush and McCain, and being laid off all over the place. You know, the press corps is no longer in, in the situation it was was in no position in, in calendar year '08 to really really investigate Chicago and his 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 or, his, his career in, in Illinois politics. Mm-hmm. But I think they will go back now. So is your is your premise that it's basically impossible to rise through the rank of Chicago politics without being crooked? I, it is my premise that it is impossible to rise to the ranks of Chicago politics without being in contact with a lot of crooks. Now, uh, there are, it's still, if you look, if everybody else is taking a bribe and you don't, then you didn't take a bribe. Uh... And there are issues of conspiracy about what you knew, and you know, and so on and so on. But he, I'll even give him that. I'm just saying that I think that the full portrait of how politics works and how he 
got the state senate nomination and the, and then the the senate nom the, the the US senate nomination I think this would will be fascinating it might not stop him from being a very popular and very successful two-term president but I think that this idea that Hyde Park was some little island of sort of high-minded liberalism and so on you know it it it, it might be a high-minded island of liberalism but it is surrounded by a huge ocean of the kind of corruption that I grew up with and saw firsthand mm-hmm. and that I don't think has changed very much. And I think that as Patrick Fitzgerald's board games, that's the code name for it, investigation continues, it'll be really, really clear just how deep and widespread uh, the corruption in Chicago is. And that will inevitably uh, reflect, at least somewhat reflect now, on Obama. Well, I mean, if he's not implicated, I think he's fine, but, but uh, in, you know, in anything directly. But, and, and and I don't think you'll have a lot of uh, curiosity directed in that direction by the press. I do, I do think he's going to get a, a reasonable honeymoon that may be extended by the sense of peril that this economy may pose. You know, I mean, I wonder if you, you'll get almost like a wartime kind of psychology when you face uh, really, really, you know, harder economic it's, it's times possible. than I've ever it, seen. It, it, it's possible. Uh, uh, although, although I think that this is where uh, it, it will be a challenge uh, to President Obama to... You know, figure out how to make sense of all this bailout stuff and so on, and 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 that I'm 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 the, the inner Hayekian in me is skeptical of, of their ability to manage, uh, you know, hundreds and billions of and then possibly trillions of dollars worth of, of bailouts. Yeah, I was wondering how the inner your inner Hayekian uh, reconciles itself with your inner populist on this uh, oh, auto e- bailout. E- easily, easily. easily. You're, you're, you're against the auto bailout. The, I, I'm not against the auto the auto bailout. I, I was certainly against TARP. I was certainly against the Wall Street bailout. Ah, so that's the uh, populist in you. They're the, 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 the populist the, 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 and the libertarian the, 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 are on the, the same the, the, side. The populist and libertarians are on the, on the same side there. Mm-hmm. I think that the, I mean, the, the kind of way I would have approached the bailout, on auto bailout, would have been, um, you know, guaranteed a purchase of cars. I mean, give a tax credit to to people to buy American cars. I would have done that. I, I, mean, I, I would I would have violated would, international trade rules, probably, uh, Jim. You're fine. not bothered by that. I'm not bothered by that. Okay. Uh, um, I would have done things to help people buy cars. Uh, I probably would have demanded that, the, that the, the entire leadership of all these companies resign. Uh, um, but then I would have done that for City I'm Group, and, City Group that. and AIG and, and Goldman Sachs and all the rest of them. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm I mean, definitely I, I, right. fine with making sure that if we're going to bail them out, that 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 their leaders um, right. suffer in the fires of hell forever, more and, or less, and, 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 and get paid a dollar. But again, I go back to, and I know, I know you don't disagree with this. What's so striking is you, you read the paper that 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 the, the banks that, that got bailed out, the banks now have given away 1.6 billion dollars in bonuses. Wow, 1.6 billion. Now, I mean, it was probably fifty billion last year, but it's still this is this this one point six billion is our money. So, I mean, yeah, I do think there's been a deep, 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 you know, class bias here in the media, where you know reporters sort of admire Wall Street masters of the universe, and in many cases are related to them or look forward to having jobs with them or went to school with them, and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. And whereas these guys in the auto industry are just dopes. And so reporters are feel free to just flail away at the car industry while mm-hmm. being sort of strangely worshipful and respectful of these Wall Street guys who are a million times, I think we'd agree in terms of dollar terms, are a million times worse or a thousand times worse or a hundred times worse, um, show no more acumen about what they're actually doing in terms of their, with their jobs and industries and, and, and companies than did Detroit, maybe less. Uh, I mean, I think most of the car executives at least like cars. It's not really even clear to me that these Wall Street types even know what they're t- doing. They know they like math. money, though. They do like money. Yeah, and, and and they've gotten a pipeline into our juggler veins in terms of more money, and I find it outrageous. And, and um, the populace in me says, you know, the the the, 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 the rather than bailing out, I'd, I'd be looking at antitrust. I'd be looking at saying, why 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 do the why will, it be, will America be well off? If there's four or five banks uh, that control all the capital in this country, and the answer is no, then let's have antitrust laws. Yeah, you want to see a very decentralized banking system. I, w- I would. I would like to see. I'd like to go back to the plan. This is an idea that has been floating around the New America Foundation. It's, I, I, I can't claim credit for it. Um, I'd like to go back, back to community banking. This idea of one big, one or two big banks, uh, liberated by by the repeal of Glass Steagall, to just loan money to everybody uh, around the world is crazy. And we, as we now see. 
Well, I think on your side of that argument is something that I think I learned from a dialogue a few months ago, which was that an early, uh, an early link in the chain of things that led to disaster was, um, I'll probably have this wrong, but the mortgage, there was a great disparity in the regional mortgage markets, and like I think it was in California that nobody could get a, a loan to buy a home. And, and that is, you know, bad. You'd like to rectify that. But I think what they did is and that was when they changed some law that made it legal to take those mortgages and sell them anywhere, kind of, whereas previously there had been some regulation that forced them to sell the mortgages in California. But anyway, then this, this long chain slowly got created and everybody lost track of it. And uh, there was a, just a huge gap between the, the underlying asset and the owner of the asset and there was a, a problem of information flow between them or something. And, and, and pride in ownership, pride in, 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 in makership, if, that, if that's a word. I mean, the one thing I've always observed about pe people who actually are associated with the manufacturer or something is if, if, they, if they're good, they know their product inside out. They care about it. Mm -hmm. they, they care about their computer. They care about their coffee. They care about their Jack Daniels whiskey. They care about their paintbrush. Whatever it is they make, they know, and they live and breathe it, and the passion for their product shows through. Mm -hmm. This Wall Street stuff is just the, the height of cynicism, where, as you say, uh, they have no idea who, who, who the mortgage came from. They have no idea who's going right. to sell the mortgage, who's going <clears> to <throat> end up owning the mortgage. All they know is that they're going to slice it and dice it in 15 different ways, and, and somebody in China will get part of it, and somebody in, in Germany will get another part of it. And there's no sense of doing a good job or managing right. a reputation or building goodwill in a community. And the results are, as we, are what we see. They're sort of catastrophic, and I think we, you and I probably would share in the opinion that it's going to get worse, much worse, before it gets better. I fear. And this is what you get when you get power disconnected from responsibility. And so the idea of local banks uh, where, the, where the guy is sort of somewhat socially regulated by the, the, the opinion of the people in the community around him and so on, um, I think is very appealing. Well, and, 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 the, and, and, and in the old days, the question was, when somebody gave you a mortgage, the question they asked was, will you be able to pay the mortgage, pay, make the mortgage payments for 30 years? Now the question they ask is, can I unload this to somebody who doesn't live anywhere near here? Right. Can I unload it in 15 seconds? In which case, then I can do another one. Right. And and that's just a that's, that's a public policy mistake that both parties, you know, and I, 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 I were very much deeply involved in, because because it, it was a it, there's a steady line of prog progression between what the what the Clinton and Bush administrations were doing on exactly this issue. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure decentralization and, and, and a return to regionalization is the answer, but... I, I, I would agree. call it compartmentalization, by the way, yeah. with, with all the compartmentalized implies. In other words, you can, you, right. know, you can blow a hole in that part of the ship, but the rest of the ship stays, stays afloat. Okay. But you're for something a little like the auto bailout in, in, in intended effect, at least, although it sounds like you wouldn't buy into the bailout as it is structured. I, I mean, I think that just... I mean, if, as a practical matter, uh, you know, there's, there's, there probably has to be there has to be some allowance made for the continuation of industrial manufacturing in the United States, especially cars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, 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 that 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 makes some sense to me, uh, um, especially if you know why we to, to fight over 15 billion, which I admit will be a lot more than 15 billion when all said and done. Uh, when we've already spent, you know, five, seven hundred billion, and probably going to spend a lot more than that uh, on bailouts that nobody's even heard of. I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, how, how many people know that the FDIC uh, made a hundred and thirty-nine billion dollar loan guarantee to General Electric Capital? That's not TARP. That's not the Fed. That's not the Treasury Department. That's the FDIC. How, how did they get the power to um, to do that? Uh, I mean, again, I, I, I have a lot of concerns about the auto bailout, including the fact that Congress seems to have opposed it, and yet they went ahead and did it, did it anyway. But I, I would have, if I were Bush, I would have gone back and said, look, you rejected the original bailout plan I had. Here's another bailout idea I had. You know, again, the, the, my idea was very simple. Either make it cheap for people to buy American cars or give them a huge tax credit for doing it, which is the same, that same thing. Mm -hmm. Somehow buy down the price to get these cars off a lot. Okay. So, um... Speaking of billions of dollars, uh, Bernard Madoff. Yes, Madoff, Madoff, Madoff. Yeah, it's, he, as, in, made as, off, in, as in Madoff, made off exactly. like a bandit. I guess exactly. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm yeah. not the first with that joke. No, no, no. Um, the the uh, 
Now, first of all, you know, I'm thinking the magnitude of this is, not, is going to be not quite as great as people are saying. I mean, here, the Daily News says that uh, hundreds of charities that feed the poor and house the sick have been wiped out. I Tell me if I'm wrong, but I think some of this is going to be kind of um, temporary and ultimately not as dramatic, uh, but, because I think the problem that all of these institutions face is that the assets have been frozen, right? It isn't clear that all the assets have disappeared. I, I'm having trouble imagining that this guy personally spent $50 billion, you know. And also, my understanding of the way the scheme works would imply that a non-trivial amount of the money has to still exist in, in real assets somewhere, right? Well, and, and let, I mean, you, you could be right, but unless the nature of a Ponzi scheme is people put money in and then you, when people in good faith mm -hmm. and, and ask for it back, you give it to them, in which case the, your, the fifty billion that went in could mm -hmm. actually have, or much of it, it could have, or all of it, it could have gone to other people. Now that would make a real mess because there's a there's a term in law called you know if, if, if Madoff c c committed fraud to, to to boil it down, then there's a there's a f term called fraudulent convey fraudulent conveyance, in which if I give you stolen property, right, because uh, I stole it from somebody else. Then the government can eventually come if they, after they catch me. They can go back to you and right. say, "Look, Bob, fork it over." So it could be that fifty billion is actually in the hands of other people who thought they were simply wise investors mm -hmm. and had done well by Madoff. I mean, I, and that would make some unbelievable lawsuits as the people who lost the fifty billion try and collect the fifty billion from others. I mean, but you're quite right. I mean, it somehow, you know, Madoff had a house in Park Avenue and one in the Hamptons and one in France. That doesn't. You, that doesn't. That doesn't add to fifty billion. But um, you know, again, reporters, as as we've agreed, are you know, uh, mm -hmm. tend to speak in a shorthand. And and I mean, well, you know, this, this, I can remember back when in the era of the big mergers, they would say there's been a two hundred billion dollar merger between, you know, uh, Mercedes Benz and Chrysler. Well, it wasn't really two hundred or eighty billion or whatever it was. But point is, it, if if you sort of add the two companies up together and assume that that's but the real the amount of money that's actually transacted between the two is very small. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, so reporters can you know, obviously have an interest in, in headlines of making it seem as big and dramatic as possible. But I, I, I agree the number could be a lot smaller. Yeah, no, I think some of these foundations that have closed will find that when things are unfrozen, they have at least a little in the way of assets. Um, there's some group that's sponsoring something I was supposed to speak at in a couple of months, but I just learned that they're out of business because of this. So, um, so there's, there's the recession hitting home, huh? Yeah, well, they weren't going to pay me anything anyway, needless to say, in the modern information economy. But uh, the, uh, So do you think I'm being too charitable to think that he could have slipped into this in a kind of innocent way? Do you think that's crazy? I have a scenario. Oh, go ahead. Well, it's it's like... I, I'll give you some rope. Go ahead. Okay, so you, yeah. you, you start out, you know... I mean, first of all, the, for this scheme to have worked, I think he had to originally have been actually making some money because he had to slowly gather confidence in his system, right? right. So I think, you know, first round, I'm guessing maybe, you know, a few years into this fund, he's <clears throat> got this hard-earned reputation for delivering 10% every year with low risk, and he's really kind of done it. And then he gets to year four, and, oh, he's only going to make 9.7%. And he's just loving this reputation, right, for making 10%. So he figures, well, I know the following year is going to be a good year. So I'll just take a little out of what people have invested for the following year, and then, then, then next year I'll, like, replay it, repay it, you know. I can imagine you just kind of sliding slowly into this this thing. You think that's too charitable? No, I, I, I think that's reasonable. I mean, remember, the guy had a... Pretty good reputation as a financial whiz. I mean, he was the chairman of the Nasdaq. Right. You know? I mean, I mean, I mean, he clearly had the respect of his peers mm -hmm. in a big way as a smart guy and a good. I mean, he, he did all sorts of innovations on electronic trading and so on and so on. And I, and I you know, the, the, look, the bull market, uh, you know, made everyone look like a genius. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you now the bull market, by most reckonings, began in 1982, and that's so what we've had. One reason the stock market went from 700 to 14,000 for a while. I could I could imagine exactly that. It had three or four good years, and then all of a sudden he hits a down year. And rather than just sort of fessing up and said, "Look, you know, I'm not that much smarter than the market. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm a little smarter, maybe. I can get I can slightly outperform the market. But if the market's going down consistently, I can't go up consistently. I mean, and, and every every smart stock analyst will say, "Look, in the in the long run, you you know." 
you're lucky to beat the market at all, mm-hmm. uh, let alone by a big margin. So yeah, I, I could I could see it happening that way. Although of course, that's actually how most scandals begin. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. uh, very very rarely in a scandal do does, does somebody sort of wake up and have a light bulb over his head and say, I'm going to start committing crimes now. Well, even Blagojevich, you can imagine how he kind of, you know, I mean, first he says, uh, okay, so wait a second. I mean, so suppose I want somebody appointed in exchange for making this appointment, you know, years ago. Like, okay, as long as you don't say it explicitly, that's legal. If you kind of both know it's happening, but you don't explicitly make the deal, that's legal. And he says to himself, but in terms of the actual corruption of the public interest, how different is that from just making it explicit? And, and, and then so he does an explicit swap of appointments. And then he says, you know, in terms of the corruption of public interest, how different is this from me just accepting a cash payment? Either way, I'm appointing somebody who's not the perfect person in exchange for something. What's the diff, you know? I mean, there's always a slippery slope, you know? There is, and, that, and that's where lawyers come in. I mean, because I mean, obviously, you know, at, at some level, every political deal could be thought of as a bribe. Yeah. Uh, and yet, there's, I, mean, I guess again, this is where the I, I'm reasonably satisfied that the U.S. The United States Code has s- clarified the difference between, you know, interest group politics and corruption. And I'm also pretty mm-hmm. satisfied, as the subject you are, <laughs> yeah. that will end up on the wrong side. <laughs> yeah. Although I've got to say, although I've tried to give them both the charitable interpretation here, um, although you should never judge people by appearances. It does seem to me that Madoff, like, looks like a nice guy who could have gotten into it innocently, whereas, you know, Blago looks like, what, like serial killers. Well, I mean, he, he, to me, he, he reminded me of, of, of Jimmy Cagney in the movie White Heat from about 1949. I don't know if you ever saw that. At the end of the movie, he's a deranged cr- criminal, and he gets on top of an oil tanker, like an oil uh, drum, um, and... You know, he's shooting at the cops, the cops are shooting back, and, and then the, the thing blows up, and, and as the thing's on fire, he says, you know, top of the world, ma, and then the thing explodes. <laughs> and this, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, a kind of a nutty defiance in Blagojevich that I think takes him out of the realm of your normal Chicago politician who's angry when they get caught because they're, they're, they hate getting caught into some kind of elaborate system of self-justification on Blagojevich's part that clearly has a clinical... Uh, you know, DRM um, element to it. You think so? I do. Okay. You don't think it's just the, the culture of Chicago politics? I, I think he's beyond. I mean, I think it is the culture of Chicago with an extra fillip of nuttiness. Nuttiness yeah. as the hair and everything else about him. Uh, the hair. Now, for example, I, you know, if, I don't know. I happen to see it on Fox. There, there was a after Bogoyevich's press conference. Mm-hmm. His two lawyers had a press conference, and. One of them has the very memorable name of Sam Adams Jr. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I don't think he's related to the Adams family of, you know, colonial America. Maybe the other Adams family. Maybe the other Adams family, recent the guy popular from the culture. Charles Adams, yeah. the cartoonist or something like that. But anyway, he, he, he was big and bombastic and looked like somebody out of The Sopranos. And the lawyer, they would ask him a question, he'd argue back and stuff. And I don't, I don't think it helped Bogoyevich very much to have this guy in a... In a, in a dispute with reporters over the meaning of words and so on like that. But it was entertaining, I'll, I'll say that. Um, and he was much more of just sort of your standard sort of courthouse lawyer type, you know, that you see, you know, floating around in, in the as a remora on the shark of these crooks in these big cities. Mm-hmm. But in retrospect, you think the hair was one of the warning signs. <laughs> no, I mean you do, right? That's I mean, I mean, I, 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 in a way, I, I don't want to dwell on you know his personal appearance. Although this is certainly an optional element of his personal appearance, it would seem like he kind of had a a hair thing. Well, sort of a celebration of himself mm-hmm. that took him out of the normal realm of just what we see in politics. I mean, they're all by definition they're egomaniacs, but for him to look like that and, and to mm-hmm. I mean it wasn't I'm not the so, one who had an aide carrying his hairbrush for him calling no. it the football as in the nuclear codes so I mean I mean just but what about Donald Trump then should a grand jury take a closer look at him <laughs> I mean like Donald Trump to me is one of the big fakes of all time and, and when I keep when I read that that uh, his empire quote unquote is 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 once again uh, uh, you know uh, fizzling and that you know stocks way down and the Casinos aren't making their payments and something like that. Mm-hmm. I think Trump's always been kind of a phony, 
Um, and his error is further proof of that. Okay, Obviously. so you're two for two. I'm trying to think of someone with uh, with bad hair who's who's a good, or good, who's or a good, good hair guy. or self consciously good hair. I mean, I mean you know, uh, uh, I well, I'll leave it to you to, to think of others. But I, yeah. I, I well, that guy eraser head in that David Lynch movie, <laughs> he kind of won my heart. Yeah, right, but he. And he never he never borrowed money from you. That's you, true. You would have gotten tired of him fast if you said, no, listen, you're, you're really going to deliver for me on this office building, aren't you? Yeah. No, you make a good point. Yeah. Um, so what else is there? Uh, you got any opinions on any anything else? You got any, any uh, what do you think about this? I have, a, I have one quick question for you. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, the uh, Somalia. Oh, yeah. Now, y- you know, first of all, you got these pirates which are one manifestation of the chaos in Somalia. Um, as for the origin of the chaos in Somalia, you know, a couple of years ago, I mean, Somalia has been disorderly for more than a decade. Uh, uh, 20 years almost. Yeah, and <clears throat> there was a period a couple of years ago where this Islamic courts movement was, if nothing else, close to bringing some actual order to Somalia, but there were some, um, definitely some radical elements there. We were not happy about that, and we kind of supported this, Ethiopian invasion of Somalia, which was meant to cleanse it of this, these radical Islamists, they went into insurgency, uh, and now they're back, and the Ethiopians are about to call it a day, and so it sounds like you're going to wind up with Islamists who, by most accounts, are actually, if anything, more radical than the ones we wouldn't we wouldn't settle for a couple of years ago. Now, now first of all, am I, do you, do you buy I, that? I think, I think that's about right. I yeah. think that, that uh, um, once again, nation-building uh, proves to be problematic. Um, well, what is your so? What should we have done in your in your view uh, two years ago when these uh, Islamists were were becoming the government? Nothing. Yeah, that's kind of my view. I, I mean, I think we should all we'd always say, "No, listen, you, you pretty much can do what you want in your own country, but what you can't do, of course, is violate international shipping right rights and so on, as high seas and so on and so on." So. We're going to, I mean, I, I mean, for the life of me, I, I don't understand why this piracy thing has, I mean, again, I, I, I blame a lot of it on Iraq. I think Iraq is so totally preoccupied, uh, the U.S. military, that the basics that, you know, uh, Stephen Decatur would have understood is important, which is to go fight pirates. Uh, they, can't, they can't do anymore because they're so focused on Baghdad. You gonna remind us who Stephen Decatur is? By uh, he was one of the heroes of the, the Barbary, against the Barbary pirates, mm. as I recall. Uh, there are a lot of streets named after him. There are. You know, he's a great man. He's the one. He's the one who coined the phrase, and I'm going to only paraphrase it here. Uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, may our country always be in the right, but even if it's wrong, it's still our country. So my country, oh. right or wrong? I mean, mm-hmm. that's him. Uh, he died in a duel, uh, um, but I th- and there's a Decatur house uh, on on the Lafayette Park, and of course there's a million Decaturs and Decatur streets and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure he fought the Bar- Barbary pirates, although I could be. No, I'm trusting you on this one. Yeah. I mean, I, well, we'll have to. Just, I, I don't. Fortunately, I don't, have, I don't have a Google right in front of me. But otherwise, um, in any case, uh, the, look, that's exactly what the U.S. Navy should be doing. And they're, the fact that they're not, and the fact that this is even, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that the Indians, you know, are, uh, they, as in the country of India, are having a navy now, and they're sinking pirate ships, or at least, and you know, they're, they've given up on any sort of Gandhi-like pretensions of being, you know, international peaceniks. And meanwhile, the Chinese, um, for the first time in 600 years. Are you know sending uh, talking about sending ships beyond their own shores? I, uh, this is a, this this is an interesting case where, for reasons that nobody can be against, which is to say, okay, if, if America can't protect international shipping, then we'll have to, you know, uh, mount up our own navies to go do it. We're going to wind up with some pretty hot international potential flashpoints there. If we have American, Chinese, Indian, NATO. Whoever else ships floating around in the same region, doing police work, this could. This, if, if they read Non-Zero, Bob, they will all understand. There is interest. a Chinese edition of Non-Zero. <laughs> That's right. If they understand, and then they then they will say, "Listen, it is in our interest to work together and, and, and harmoniously to thwart international banditry." Well, why shouldn't they? I mean, they, 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 should, they, they should. actually they do should. have unity of purpose here. Yeah, they I do. would think we want to share both the financial burden and the burden of blowback, right? So. Why not? Why isn't this I'm, a case? I'm totally, I'm totally with All you. Right. Ex- 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 I'm totally with you, except as oftentimes happens in situations, you know, Murphy's Law applies, 
And one of these days, with these, one of these countries is going to want a navy base in Somalia or Ethiopia. I guess Ethiopia is now landlocked, but Eritrea or Kenya or something like that. And we're going to have another uh, flashpoint with all the oil from the Persian Gulf and everywhere else. And so, it's, it's, I mean, well, it's this is the not- origins of every war. Not every war. The origins of many great wars, most obviously World War One, came out of different interests vying for a place in the sun in the same limited space. And, you know, there's not, there's not a whole lot to be done about it. And obviously this is where the United Nations and other international diplomacy uh, mechanisms can be very valuable. Yeah. And I'm all for them. Um, I'm just a little bit, you know, worried that, just, that, that, that this, again, united in a good cause is going to have a... There's going to be an accident here somewhere that we're going to come to regret. Could but be. I, we got to we got to sink the Somali pirate ship. So I'm I'm all for that. Um, the uh, I was going to applaud you a couple minutes ago when you said we should have we should have told the Islamic Courts Union or whatever it's called. Okay, you're running Somalia. You know, do what you will, but you got to respect international law and so on and blah blah blah. And also, presumably, you'd agree you can't be like, um, you know, aiding and abetting terrorists within your borders and so on. But. Um, I was going to applaud. Where, where did I lose you, Beth? Well, well, here, I mean that that part of realism I like. The the um, but then but but now you've been manifesting what I would call old-fashioned realism, which is a belief in the near inevitability of conflict among great powers. I do think that the the the, the first of all, the, the sheer logic behind conflict between great powers has been waning and to some extent we're seeing their actual behavior catch up with that fact. I think I think China understands actually uh, without having read non-zero the non-zero some dynamics when they see them and they're, they're not acting in an especially belligerent fashion. I think great power relations are totally manageable. We unfortunately have a new 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 whole new array of threats largely having to do with terrorism. Uh, that the great powers need to cooperate in in overcoming. So I, I don't think you know the world is on balance more benign than it was a uh, hundred years ago. But I, I don't share your view and the view of many traditional realists that great power conflict is almost inevitable. Okay. Well, uh, one way to find out, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fast forward history, or just sit back and watch it happen. I mean, I think that look, there's uh, better communications. Uh, there's a sli- there's something I, I'll even agree with you. There's a, there's a little bit of a learning curve about but no, but things mistake. are but, more. But, but I, what, I, what I would add, though, on the other side, is the multiplicity of great powers, if you will, and the ever increasing number of countries with nuclear weapons. Well, that is a true problem. But but yeah. I, I'm also arguing not just that communications are better, but that the, it is literally more in the interests of great powers to work out their issues together than it was, I mean, for example, old-fashioned empire used to be a viable business model, right? Conquering large swaths of territory. I mean, first of all, it used to be the case that more of the wealth resided in the land per se, so conquest was literally more profitable back before we had an information economy. Um, it is now the case that more of the value of foreign lands can be extracted from them without conquering them, okay? So there, there are... Well, yes, yeah, but that's yes and no. But it's also the case that the the commodity is still worth a lot. Oil being a good example. Well, yeah, oil. And, and, and but I, markets I would, let you get your oil without owning the land. I, I I wouldn't be too surprised in the end if some great power says, "Listen, it's nice to be trading with these Arabs and stuff like that, but we just rather own it ourselves." Um, well, some people know. think that that's what the U.S. did okay, in 2003. So they, I, I don't really think that was a primary motivation myself. I, I, I don't either, particularly. But, but I'm saying I think I, I just wouldn't rule that out as a possibility. And when you and, and when you see, for example, that South Korea, you know, not commonly thought of as on the roster of imperial countries, is buying up a huge chunk of the nation of the island nation of Madagascar on the east coast of Africa. Didn't know that. Yeah, they are to, to grow things. I mean, they're, they're you know, they, I mean, South Korea is a, a rich country without much arable land, and they can afford to make you know hundred year leases with Madagascar to grow. You know, I mean, I've, I've forgotten what it was. Since I read the paper a few weeks ago. Now, the, the the question then is 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 this is does this South Korea's huge presence? I mean, apparently the size of the land that they're going to grow crops on in Madagascar is the size of Portugal. I mean, it's a big big chunk of territory. 
is a South Korea, South Korean presence in Madagascar, not to mention the unbelievable Chinese presence all across Africa, you know, where, you know, you know uh, in pursuit of minerals. Will this be a, a non-zero-ish uh, bunch of transactions where the Chinese say, look, here's, here's money for your corrupt dictatorship, and now give us the manganese or cobalt or, you know, or diamonds or, or whatever it might be. Um, or will that inevitably spill over into, you know, we, we could get a better price, a, a lower price for our materials, minerals, and so on, if we change the government there? Mm-hmm. And again, I mean, I mean your, your points about slippery slopes on both Bogoyevich and Madoff are well taken. They might well have begun life as something different than they are now, but that by, through the power of marginal thinking and marginal increments, uh, they transform themselves over time from, you know, whatever they were to whatever they are now. And I, by, the, by, I would, by the same token, I would su- suspect that we're seeing a kind of a slippery slope marginality on this next wave of imperialism and great power conflict. Mm-hmm. Well, I have a totally devastating reply. <laughs> but unfortunately, we've reached the one-hour mark, Jim. So people are just going to have to stay tuned. So, I, so I, 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 was, I was wise to filibuster just to, get, to push you back. <laughs> yeah, I was about your, your only way out of that mess, I would say, was to stall, was to go into a delay game, and you did it masterfully, and I was too polite to interrupt with so, my devastating so, reply. So should, should I plan on never doing another blogging heads with you, or should I just hope you forget what your point was by the time uh, 2009 rolled around. If I were you, I would quit while I was only slightly behind, <laughs> Jim. Um, and, uh, okay, well, in that case, Bob, to you, Merry Christmas. To, to, to others, Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays, as I, the case may be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have it both ways and say Merry Holidays to everyone <laughs> and Happy Christmas to people in Britain who actually say that, right? They say Happy Christmas in Britain. That's two countries separated by a common language. Exactly. Anyway. So anyway, no, but really, uh, you know, peace and universal brotherhood, right? Yep, yep, yep. I I agree with you. Thanks, Bob. It's been fun. Okay, as always. See ya. Bye-bye.